thing. Buckers and Shays and so on and everybody who contributed. Thank you. So, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is one of those holidays where for 362 days of the year, we don't need to be thankful at all because we save it all up for Thanksgiving weekend. Am I right now? So it's a, it's a time, it's an occasion where we focus on something, which is Thanksgiving. Much like at Christmas, we focus on the fact that the Father had a plan to bring us back into relationship. And the plan was that he would give his own son and send his son. And he wouldn't just take the short route. He wouldn't just pop Jesus in for one day to, be, to pay the price and then be gone. He, he actually dropped him into history. He actually dropped his son into history to experience being a man, what it was like to be a human being, so that he could, he could be our faithful high priest. So we celebrate that at Christmas, but not just at Christmas. It's just that at Christmas, we actually... Uh, think about it more, you know, more intensely, possibly. Then Easter is, is the time when we, when we celebrate the fact that, that, first of all, Jesus paid an enormous price. He was actually shed his blood for our sin so that we could have access back to God. And, and so... Pentecost is when we celebrate that the Father kept his word. That because Jesus paid the price and he went into the Holy of Holies in heaven and said, it's done, it is finished, then the Father sent the promise. The Holy Spirit is called the promise of the Father. So that Jesus' prophecy over the disciples on the last day or so of his being on earth, he says, it's better for you that I go away, because if I don't go away, then the Holy Spirit can't come. And so when Jesus was just with the people he was actually physically with, now the Holy Spirit is with every Christian everywhere throughout the whole world at all times. He's the promise. And so we celebrate that on Pentecost, and we, so we emphasize certain things at certain times, but they're not just for those times. They're just so that we have a point of contact, a point of emphasis, and so the same way with, with thanksgiving. I think sometimes we, we read scriptures about being thankful and, and we go, oh, man, you know, might be easy for everyone else, but it's tough for me to be thankful. You know, be, be thankful. And, well, let me just read you a few of them. What is it with all these always be thankful scriptures? Doesn't God know that sometimes we don't want to be thankful? That we don't feel like being thankful? Doesn't he know that we go through tough? Oh, yeah, he knows we go through tough times. He was here and went through. He showed us how to live like a child of God in a hostile world. Just read your Bible. The world was hostile to Jesus. And he showed us how to live like a child of God in a hostile world. He showed us how to be thankful in all situations. So Ephesians 5.20, give thanks for everything. Say everything. To God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5, starting at 16. Always be joyful, never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. How many belong to Christ Jesus? Well, uh, you know, you, sometimes you hear, oh, I wonder what God's will for my life is. Well, let me just tell you. The scripture tells you it's that you live a life of thanksgiving. It says, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. That's God's will for your life, is to live thankful. Okay. The message says, thank God no matter what happens. This is the way God wants you who belong to Christ to live. The Passion says it this way, for this is God's perfect plan for you. So when he's saying, be thankful for everything, does that mean for all the tough things that we go through. Is that what it means? For all the tough circumstances, be thankful. I'm so thankful that I got fired from my job or that, you know, I, you know, I didn't get paid this week. Or I'm so thankful. that Is that what we're supposed to be thankful for? Really? Hmm. Pay attention, Pamela. <laughs> Does, 
Does God delight? Does God delight in trying to make us do mental and emotional gymnastics? Does God delight in sort of grabbing our ear and saying, "Be thankful"? No. Let's remember who God is. Let's remember who, that He's our Father. Let's remember that He made us. He formed us in our mother's womb. Let's remember that He knows the way for us to thrive in this life, in any situation. He knows, he knows how we're put together, so he knows what attitude will bring out the best in us, what attitude will make us our true and authentic self. And so when he says be thankful, he's not trying to, you know, like, you know, put you in a headlock and try to force you to be thankful for bad stuff. He says, have an, if you have an attitude, if you live your life in an attitude of thanksgiving, let thanksgiving take over more and more and more of your thought life, of your, of, uh, you know, it, it has to start inside. We, we all know you can say anything you want. You can say thank you all you want. How many have ever said thank you to somebody and you weren't really thankful? It's just the thing to say, right? You know, so thank you. You know, really what, what you... <laughs> What, what you wanted to say is, you want to say it really sarcastically, like, thank you. Like, it's the same way of saying, you're special. You're so special. You're so special. <laughs> Pam. <laughs> so God made us, and he knows what it takes to make us thrive in whatever situations. He knows that we can't thrive when we're grumbling and complaining and negative. He knows that we can't thrive even if we try to stay neutral and maybe we bite our tongue and don't grumble and complain, but inside, you see, we're not being thankful. We're not being gracious. We cannot thrive in negativity, in, in constantly pointing out what's wrong with our surroundings. You ever notice how um, when, when somebody gets negative, it, it's always outward? Like, not that often somebody comes to you and, 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 and starts to pour out how negative they are themselves. You know, it's usually somebody else or some circumstance or situation that we're in. You know, we, we want to, you know, pour that out. When we're negatively focused, it's usually about someone else or something else. But a lifestyle of ungratefulness isolates us. One of the one of the hindrances of not being having a thankful spirit, of not living a life of thankfulness, of being a negative, you know, person or a person who complains and sees the glass half empty all the time, is that it hurts you relationally. The people who are who are around you who should be pouring life into you, whose lives you should be pouring life into, are it's shut off. The tap is shut off. Some you know, if you wonder maybe if you've ever wondered in your life, you know. Where's my friends, or I'm lonely, or, you know, where's my community? Well, maybe being not be, living a lifestyle of thankfulness, maybe being negative, maybe being critical of a lot of things around you is putting up barriers and walls. I mean, it's not the only thing, but it's certainly a thing. It is. It's a thing. So, you hurt yourself when you're not thankful. God's not trying to press you into some kind of a, you know, emotional struggle where you try so hard to be thankful. He knows that that's the only way you're going to thrive and really find out who you really are. So, negativity always focuses us away from God, but thankfulness turns our, our attention or turns our focus back to God. When we sing, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart, you know, we used to sing that song all the time way back in the early days, you know. I was going to sing it for you, but maybe we'll hold off on that for now. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, how do we enter his gates with thanksgiving? Does that mean on Sundays when we come here, you know, all the rest of the week, you know, that, that doesn't apply. But on Sundays when we come, if we're thankful, then we enter his presence. Well, that works for that time. Think about what would happen. Think how, you know, some people say, I'm not really aware of God's presence. Thankfulness, when it says, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart, you're saying, you know, I will enter into your presence when I am thankful. 
I will, uh, so if you live a lifestyle of being thankful, just think how much more of your life will be spent aware of his presence in your life. Because God, you know, he, he, you know, he, he, he loves it when we, when we recognize that the way he's made us, the way he's made us to live, the lifestyle he wants us to live, when we're embracing it, he loves that. And he can't stay away. And so, yeah. So, of course, there's times when we don't understand what's going on. And we get overwhelmed. I mean, if you live long enough, you will, be, you will have some trauma. You'll be overwhelmed with things from time to time. People will leave you, either through, through death or through, you know, just relational breakdowns or, or financial setbacks or whatever. You will have traumas. And so, what does a lifestyle of thanksgiving look like when, when we're overwhelmed? And God knows that we're overwhelmed at times. I, I'm going to give you a little example here in a minute, but... What I want you to learn about today, Pam, is that even, even the things that you can't in the moment be thankful for, if, you're, if, you're, if you live long enough, and I'll give you an example in my own life, you will find that the things that, that were really hard at the time actually produced something in your life and actually produced uh, more relationship, more relationship with God and so on. Um, God, because you see, no matter where we are, God understands if we're overwhelmed, if we've had a trauma or if we're experiencing trauma right now or whatever. God understands our soul. He made us. He understands that we have, that we don't bounce instantaneously from the deepest, you know, depression or whatever it is, Right? deepest traumatic event. He, he knows and he's, he's walking with us. He will always give us. He's continually giving us opportunities to scratch our way back to a lifestyle of thanksgiving and to being grateful. You know, in my own life, I, I did come to a point where I didn't see there was much to be thankful for anymore. You know, it was just like last week. No, I'm just kidding. That was actually quite a long time ago, right? Oh, right. Yes. Mountaintop experience. But there was a point in my life when I had kind of given up being thankful because there just didn't seem to be anything worth thanking God for. Anybody ever been in a place like that? Come on. You know, and so I remember coming home from work to my five and a half or six kids. You know, we had one that was kind of foster in and out. And, um, and I would, I would almost, sometimes I would grit my teeth and try to be upbeat when I got home, but I just couldn't because there's nothing. I was negatively focused. I just saw everything around me as being negative. And I would come home and I would, just this cloud would precede me into the house, you know. And instead of, hey, kids, I love you, it was, hey, kids, did you do what I told you to do? So the very thing that, that I disliked about the way I was brought up, I was doing to my own kids, and it's because... I allowed myself to lose a place of being thankful and living with a positive attitude. So, but God walked me through. It took quite a while. Yeah. It took quite a while to make the choice. So he doesn't force us. He's not asking you to do mental gymnastics and, you know, emotional gymnastics. He's not twisting your ear. He's saying, here I am. You want some help with that? Let me walk you through it. Let me hold your hand. I'm with you. I'm with you. You know, we sang that song. He is with you. He is with you. He is for you. He is for you. Yeah. So, 1 Kings 19. We're not going to read the whole thing. That'll take too long. But this is Elijah's experience of the mountaintop followed by the depths. So, you, the mountaintop was the 450 prophets of Baal. You have this great big showdown. Phenomenal uh, encounter with God, culminating in slaughtering 450 priests, you know. I don't know if Elijah did that himself, but he had that done, you know. It's the way it was back then. And, uh, and, and uh, Jezebel wasn't terribly happy, was she? She was upset because the prophets of Baal were her people. They were, they were pagan, idol-worshipping people. And so she swore by her own life 
that before the sun went down, Elijah would be dead. And so Elijah, who's in town, because he, he uh, ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way back to the city, and uh, when Ahab told Jezebel what had happened out there on the, on the mountain, um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, she put out a contract on him, I guess. It was what it was. And he fled for his life. And he wandered around into the wilderness, and he left his servant behind, and he just went by himself and sat down in the shade of a tree and said, Oh, God, please take my life. Like he was practically suicidal, or at least asking God, I am so low. Like he's been the high, it might have been the high point of his career, I don't know. I'm not in his mind, but it was certainly a phenomenal victorious event where God answered with fire from heaven and, and uh, showed that God is the God and Baal is nothing, right? And he goes from that in 24 hours to the pit of depression, just kill me, please God, just take me, I'm done. So God's answer is interesting because what happens to, to him is He's laying there, and finally he gets so exhausted with all his negativity and moaning and whatever. And, you know, he, I mean, somebody's out, the queen of the land is out to kill him. He's got reason, you know. He hasn't just conjured up a bad mood. Like, he's got reason to be upset. It's traumatic. Here he thought he'd won a great victory, and now he thinks he's about to be killed. And so, anyways, God lets him mumble around by himself there for a while, and then sends an angel to wake him up. I love how in the middle of depression, God continues to provide. He continues to give us what we need to keep, to survive, to wait, to let the cloud of the trauma, whatever it is, pass a little bit so that we can see that he's right there again. And you know, when the angel wakes him up and says, eat, so he eats a bit and goes back to sleep. The angel wakes him up again. He says, you got a long journey. You better eat some more. And it says that whatever he ate there, whatever the angel brought him, sustained him for 40 days. So he, he wanders around in the wilderness for 40 more days. You know, like until he finally finds a cave, crawls into it to rest. And that's where God meets him. He's finally ready. But you see, God's been with him all along. God was with him every step of the way. And he's just waiting for his trauma, his depression to, to you know, the, the, the trauma of what happened is real. His soul is, is wounded terribly. And, and, he, and he maybe he, you know, thought God had abandoned him, whatever, you know. But God was right there. And when God finally does speak to him again, after the 40, so the first wandering and then the 40 days, I don't know, 45 days anyways, it takes for him to get to the place where he can hear. And it takes us sometimes a while. When we're going through something, God didn't expect Elijah to go, oh, on that day, I'm so thankful that Jezebel wants to kill me. Thank you, Father. Right? That's not what he's after. It's not what he's after. He's after us to come, let it run its course, and come back to a place where we recognize that God is right here. So, so Elijah has this famous encounter where, you know, God says, come out and stand in the entry of the cave. And, and uh, so a big wind comes. It's not in the wind. An earthquake comes. God's not in the earthquake. A big fire comes. God's not in the fire. So this is quite a show that I guess God is putting on for Elijah to show him that he's there. And then there's a gentle whisper. And when there's a gentle whisper, I do recognize this is God. What does God say? What are you doing here, Elijah? Oh, well, don't you understand? I've done it all my life. I've done everything you wanted me to do, and now they're out to kill me. And, eh. and God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he starts in again. And then God says to him, I don't know what else I'll transpire, but what, uh, what, what God said to him is he recommissioned him. He says, you're not done until I say you're done. Elijah, you're immortal until I take you home. Remember how Elijah went home? The fiery chariot, the whirlwind. Elijah, you can't die. Jezebel can't kill you. 
because I got work for you to do. He specifically says, get up and go back the way you came. And when you get to Damascus, it's not even Israel, you and anoint Hazael to be the king over Aram, which I guess is Syria. It's Damascus. Anoint Jehu to become the next king. Ahab's still kicking around for quite a while, but Jehu. And anoint Elisha to be prophet in your place. In other words, he recommissions him. He says, I'm not done with you. You can't die. Fear not. I am with you. And he gets up and he goes and he starts to fulfill the rest of his destiny. Did God jerk him up by the collar five minutes after the, uh, Jezebel gave him the, the, you know, put the contract on him? No. He knows what we're made of. He knows that it takes us time to process stuff. But in the end, when we come back around and we realize God's been with us all along and he presents us with an opportunity. Now, Elijah still had to make a choice, didn't he? He could have said, well, that's fine. That may be your plan for my life, but I'm done. You know, in fact, I'm going to jump off this, you know. He could have said that. God doesn't force Elijah to do anything, and he won't force you. He's just giving you an opportunity. Will you come up out of this place? Because, you know, it's great to talk about being thankful when you've got all kinds of things to be thankful for, and we can all think of things, and, you know, but what about when we're struggling? When we're struggling and we come through, and I, I picture Elijah because I've had that experience myself. I picture him later on when he's back on his horse, if he had a horse, and he's running around anointing Hazael to be the new king. And, uh, you know, he, he had this fearsome reputation. If Elijah anointed, you were going to be king, you know. If Elijah told you something, like, it was going to happen. He prophesied a drought over Israel, and for three and a half years it didn't rain. At the end of the big 450 prophet massacre, um, he prophesied that rain would come and rain fell. Like when Elijah says something, it's, it happens. So when he comes through that and he's, he comes through his depression, he comes through his thoughts of just, I just kill me now. And he, and he gets back up on his horse because he realizes God isn't finished with him yet. I bet there's a time when he looks back and he said, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for proving that my ministry, my, the vision, you know, for my life isn't my own vision, isn't my, something I've made up, isn't something I've conjured up. You have a pur You reminded me again that you have a purpose for my life. That my life is, is about fulfilling the destiny you planned for me before I was ever born. And I, and, and I bet he was thankful. I, I, I can say in my own life, you know, I'm not thankful for a lot of the things that happened. I'm not thankful that I had an accident. I'm not thankful that, you know, five or six years ago, my back was wrecked, you know, and I was in pain for, I don't know, almost three years. I'm not thankful that that happened, but you know what I'm thankful for? Because right in the beginning of that, even before the, you know, even the, some of the agonizing pain had, had subsided, God said to me, you know, I said, why, God, why? I can't hardly do anything. He says, you can do everything I, need, I want you to do right now. You can, I, you can do everything I want you to do right now. So I don't really want you to be carrying, you know, sacks of cement and, and tiling and everything else all the time like I was doing just before that. I want you to love people. I want you to hug people. I want you to care for people. I want you to teach the word. I want you to be, you know, be a pastor and you know, which, which I was before, but you know, like he's just saying, all those things that I want you to do, you can do. Even if your back hurts, you can do it. I can be a good husband. I can be a good father. I can be a good grandfather. That doesn't take a good back. It takes a good attitude. And so God, I'm, I'm thankful that I went through that because God showed me that in my weakness, his strength comes through. And so, yeah, so it's, it's not that you're thankful in the moment that you have this crisis, but recognize, come around to the fact that God is with us. He carried me through that time. He carried Elijah. Elijah thinks he's trudging around. God carried him to a special spot here in the cave. That's where I'm going to meet him. Wrote it in Elijah's book before Elijah was born. 
Here's the cave where we're going to meet. Watch this. Can't wait. <laughs> Love it. So, don't have to be thankful for what happens or doesn't happen, but for who's with us in the middle of it. Because he made the right choice. Elijah goes from, oh God, just take my life. It's over. To carrying on, anointing new kings, anointing prophets that would take over when he was gone. Wow. So in the book that Pam was giving out, The Power of Thanksgiving, it says, there's a quote from there, so the choice we make to find God in every situation and give him thanks is a definite action of mind, spirit, heart, and tongue. Neg neglecting to give thanks, not giving th uh, re finding reasons to give him thanks can be our downfall into negativity. Elijah, me, you, when bad things happen to us, we have a choice to make. Will I allow this to color the rest of my life? Sure, it will affect you. When traumatic things happen, it does affect you. Will it drag me into negativity? Will it drag me into stopping, not being thankful anymore? Will it drag me away from recognizing who I, whose son I am, whose daughter you are, right? Yeah, so living a lifestyle of, of thankfulness is not a matter of having things consistently go right for you. I hope I'm making that point. Because we can all sit around a Thanksgiving table and say, well, what, what are you thankful for today? We can think of something, you know. If, if, I, if I can't think of anything, Pam will help me, you know. Thankful for my wife. Oh, yes, my wife. Yes, I'm thankful. I mean, but a lifestyle of Thanksgiving does not depend on everything going right. Because guess what? It's not going to happen. But what is our attitude in the middle of it all? So, first, uh, we're going to get to the scripture in a minute, but just the last line of it in Philippians 4.8 says, Fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God. Fasten your thoughts onto every glorious work of God. Saying that in that hymn, it said, you know, bind me to your heart or something like that. I forget the exact lines. You know, bind me to you. Like, fasten yourself. Notice, in all of these things, in all of these scriptures about being thankful, it's not pray to God that he will make you thankful. It's not go up for prayer and get laying on of hands to have a spirit of thankfulness. That's not what it is at all. What it is is, you must choose. It's, it's, the, it's the priceless gift that God has put into every human being. The ability to choose. Will I let this ultimately drag me down? Or will I find God? No matter how long, if it takes 40 days or longer. Will I find God after a trauma and ask him where he was? Ask him to show me. Am I done? You know, have you got something else for me? Because he'll, he'll, he will happily fill you in on what his plan is for the rest of your life, just like he was with Elijah. Elijah. So Colossians 1, may you be filled with joy. Verse 11, always thanking the Father, for he has enabled you to share the inheritance who belong to his people who live in the light. See, sometimes when we can't think of anything to be thankful for, if you've got nothing to be thankful for, well, listen up for the next couple of minutes. Read you a few scriptures. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance. He rescued you from the kingdom of darkness and transferred you into the kingdom of his dear son. He purchased your freedom and forgave your sins. All right? Is that dependent on bad circumstances in your life this very moment? No, it's not. That's over and above all that. That's the position you sit in. If you belong to Jesus, you've been transferred, you've been forgiven. Wow, you're free. Not only that, but Ephesians 1, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us. He decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. This is what he wanted to do, and it gives him great pleasure. Nobody twisted his arm. Romans 8, what shall we say about all these wonderful things? For if God is for us, who can be against us? 
yeah, circumstances can suck, you know, like your, your life can, can just, could sometimes be, I'm not trying to drag you down, those of you who are currently sitting on a mountaintop, but I think you can relate to times in your life. And if you're still breathing at the end of this, there may be more times in your life yet where you have wonder what on earth is going on. What's happening? Where's God? But I want you to know that what God wants you to do is to is not to be thankful for the really bad things that happen, but to wa- be thankful that He is with you. It's not that the accident happened. It's that He was with you in the accident. He'll carry you. He'll bring you through. Thank you, God. And if there comes a time when you go through something and He decides that your time is done and you're, you're on the last page of your book, He will bring you through to your home. I go to prepare a place for you. When it's done, I'm going to come and get you. I said this many times. I know when my place is ready because Jesus is going to come and get me. And it's going to be so much better. And I'm going to go five seconds afterwards. I'm going to go, why did I hang on? What was I hanging on to? This is awesome. (laughs) So no matter what happens, he will carry us through. No one, no power, the sky above or the earth below, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ our Lord. Romans 8, we are God's children. So, summing it up, Philippians 4, 8. Friends, I say to you, you'll do your best by filling your mind and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. That's what we get to fill our minds with. Oh, God, fill my mind with the good. That prayer may not be answered because God will say, that's your job, my boy. It's your job. You fill your mind. You be thankful. You stop looking at the ugly. You stop finding things to curse. Instead, find things to bless. You do it. I'll help you. I'm with you. I live in you. I hold your hand. I'm right beside you. I'm your dad. I'm your father. If dad bothers you. I'm your father. But you need to make the choice to be positive. The passion says, so keep your thoughts continually fixed. Say continually fixed. That means on Sundays, right? Only when things are going good, right? Yeah, Sunday, seven days a week. That's right. The Lord's day is every day. Continually fixed on what is authentic and real, honorable, admirable, beautiful, respectful, pure, holy, merciful, and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising Him always. I love the way Colossians 3 puts it in the message in the end of Verse 15, he says, and cultivate thankfulness. I like that word picture, don't you? Cultivate thankfulness. Cultivating means it's something that you do over a period of time. It's not like, okay, today and from this moment on, I shall be thankful. I mean, that, that's, that's a good, you know, it, it's okay to, to say things like that, to determine things like that, but the, the picture that, that happens here in, in Colossians is that we cultivate it. It requires practice. You know, if we cultivate thankfulness in our everyday life, our everyday problems will take less and less emotional energy. How many have learned that to be true? Listen, if you're a negative person, if, you're, if, you, if you are not positive and thankful, just the everyday stuff that you go through takes a lot of emotional energy. But if, on the other hand, you've decided to be thankful, if for nothing else, that you're forgiven and transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, just that. But if you're positive and thankful, your everyday problems take less of your emotional energy. You learn to stay connected to the source. You learn that every time you're thankful, you enter his gates. Every time you're thankful, you enter into, in other words, an awareness of his presence with you. 
Yeah. So it goes on in, in verse 16 and 17. How do we cultivate thankfulness? Let the word of Christ, the message, have the run of the house. Give it plenty of room in your lives. Instruct and direct one another using good common sense. And sing. Sing your hearts out to God. Let every detail of your life, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. So it takes, this is something that we're in the process of learning to do. This is something that we're cultivating. We're cultivating it. One of the ways we cultivated it was um, during this time when I was somewhat less than positive, um, Pam would put a, a thankfulness list on the fridge and we encouraged the kids and, and all to, to write something down on it. You know, if not every day, then, you know, so the fridge, you know, if, you, if you're raising a big family, the fridge is the center of the universe, right? Especially when our first two were boys. When they hit, you know, they were just always in the fridge. Surprised it kept anything cold, but whatever. So here posted on the fridge was a thankfulness list, and it was a constant reminder. Thankful for everything. Thankful that so-and-so bought me a coffee today. Thank you that, you know, that, uh, you know, whatever. Just be finding things to be thankful for all the time. It's cultivating an attitude of thankfulness. So, another quote from the thankfulness book, Power of Thanksgiving. When momentary light afflictions, as the Bible says, come our way, most of us at first succumb to anxiety. Keeping our eyes on the unseen takes practice. It takes practice. It's our job. It's what we do. It's not imparted to us by the laying on of hands. It's something we need to do. Thanking God in every situation takes practice. Hearing his voice in our moments of panic takes practice. Thanking God keeps us looking to him, however. So, Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about anything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. So, how do you want to live in peace, no matter what's going on around you? Thanking God for all he has done, then you will experience God's peace. And his peace will guard your hearts and mind. Remember, God who made you, knit you together, knows how to make you thrive, knows what, what attitude, what situation will, will help you to become the full you that you were created to be. Huh going to just read a psalm and then we're going to pray but I just wanted to just since we've been here I've just been so aware of, of one of the things that God spoke to me when I was in that time of being negative and how God you know held out his hand for me to get to, to get out of that place and um, I have a background in when I was in school in sports and I was on a lot of sports teams and and uh um, I know what it's like to play a lot, and I know what it's like to sit on the bench. So, you know, like you're, you're always kind of thinking like, coach, put me in, put me in, you know. And so because I had that mindset and God, God knew that that's kind of the way I'm wired, here's what he said to me way back when, when I was feeling really negative. He said, I gave you a shot. Because like, that's, that's what you want to say to your coach. I, I, I said, Come on, coach, give me a shot. And he says, this is your shot. I'm giving you a shot. What, what do you mean? I sent you into the world. I didn't have to. I get, this is your chance. This is your opportunity. You're not on the bench. You're in the game. All of you who are alive today, you're in the game. The coach has put you in. This is your shot. What you do with it, of course, is up to you. But he's with you. He's for you. He put you in the game. And that actually, because it spoke so deeply to my own soul, really carried me through a lot of stuff. Yes. And I still, very many times, hundreds of times over the last few decades, I've said that to God. Thank you for giving me a shot. You didn't have to, but you put me in. You put me into the game. Thank you. If for nothing else. Games don't always go your way, do they? You know how they say, you win some, you lose some. But you're in the game. You're in the game. Coach gave 
given you a shot. Yeah. So, Psalm 100. We read a verse out of it this morning, but it's only five verses long, and I just feel like we should just, I think we should all read it together. Is, is it going to be up on the, on the board? All right. Can we just stand and just read this word of God? God is so good. A poetic psalm for, song for thanksgiving. Let's read it together. Lift up a great shout of joy to the Lord. Go ahead and do it. Everyone, everywhere, as you serve him, be glad and worship him. Sing your way into his presence with joy and realize what this really means. We have the privilege of worshiping the Lord our God, for he is the creator and we belong to him. We are the people of his pleasure. You can pass through his open gates with the password of praise Come right into his presence with thanksgiving. Come bring your thank offering to him and affectionately bless his beautiful name. For the Lord is always good and ready to receive you. He's so loving that it will amaze you, so kind that it will astound you. And he is famous for his faithfulness toward all. Everyone knows our God can be trusted, for he keeps his promises to every generation. Wow. Amen. Amen. So, Father, I ask you right now to just show us areas of our life where we have possibly allowed thankfulness to go by the boards, where we've possibly allowed uh, our circumstances to feel overwhelming. And, 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 and you walk with us through those times when we feel overwhelmed, and you're waiting there for us to realize that you're there with us, giving us an opportunity to rise above. So, Father, where we've not seen you in whatever the situation you're in right now, Father, we know that you are there. We know that you are with us, that you know that you live in us, you hold our hand, you, you, you plan our days, you plan our lives, and you walk with us through anything that we go through, and we will come out the other side. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Just show us where you want us to make the decision. Be positive and to think, think on these things. Think on what's authentic and real, true. Think of ways to bless, not run down. God. Amen. Amen. Pam. 